How's it going everybody? Today's going to be part one of how I built probably the coolest part of my upgraded home assistant garden system, the control boxes. I'm using these control boxes to interface with my sensors and devices at each one of my grow tents. They consist of a 3D printed enclosure that I designed, a little 50 watt 12 volt power supply, and the PCBs that I built. I've put a link in the description where you can find the SketchUp and STL files for the 3D printed parts, as well as the Easy EDA PCB files if you'd like to check them out. I want to first make something very clear right from the start. This is literally the first PCB I've ever built, and I'm also pretty new to building circuits like these in general. So if you choose to use any of these files in any capacity, do so completely at your own risk. None of this has been vetted or certified in any way. It's purely DIY, hobbyist level stuff that I've built for my own system. But you're free to use the ideas or modify it however you'd like. Just understand that you're responsible ultimately to make sure that the end product is done right and safe because I'm not guaranteeing anything. I'm going to share the Easy EDA files for the boards, but you'll have to download the Easy EDA software and generate the Gerber files yourself to get your own PCBs built. Let me start with a diagram of the system. So here's the PCB. This microcontroller is the heart of the whole thing. This is a 38-pin ESP32 development board, and it plugs into the PCB through headers, so you can take the board out to flash more easily or swap it with another board if need be. This ESP32 handles all the physical connections to the sensors and devices in the field, and exchanges commands and data with the Raspberry Pi running Home Assistant over a Wi-Fi connection. There are a couple other PCBs that sit atop mine on standoffs. I didn't take the time to lay out all the components from these boards onto my own PCB in this revision and just kept it simple. The red one in the top left here is the L298N motor driver board that runs the two pumps on the lid of the enclosure. It connects to the ESP32 through jumper wires and it gets powered by attaching to little solder pads on the PCB beneath it. The purple PCB in the bottom right is the isolated carrier board for my Atlas Scientific PH circuit. It also connects to the PCB via short jumper cables. It's important to electrically isolate the PH circuit so you don't get bad readings from the probe and this board does exactly that. I left another set of headers so I could stack another of these carrier boards on top and incorporate an Atlas conductivity sensor as well to measure EC in the future. Going through the rest of the board, the 12 volt power comes in here, then I've got a sensor that I'll be using to measure the water level in my reservoirs. This is something that I have not yet got around to programming, but I have installed the sensors. Then I've got terminals for controlling an AC Infinity cloud line fan via PWM. This works with the newer versions with the EC motors with the screw terminal inside that looks like this. I'm using the S series of the Cloudline fans because they don't come with the little smart controller and are therefore cheaper. I've got a couple flood inputs which I'm just connecting a length of cable to and leaving the end of the cable exposed. So if the gap between the two conductors gets bridged by nutrient solution, then the PCB knows that there's a leak. These work okay with nutrient solution, but not with regular water since it's not really conductive enough. I think this flood detection could use a rework in the future, but it works for the time being. Next I've got a pair of grow light dimming outputs. These will work for most drivers that offer 3-in-1 style dimming like Meanwell Type B drivers or the Inventronics drivers that HLG uses on a lot of their lights. On the top here I've got a Dallas one wire connection for a DS18B20 waterproof temperature sensor. I'm using one of these in each reservoir to measure the nutrient solution temperature. And finally I've got terminals for the I2C bus so any I2C devices can be easily integrated and just added to the bus on these connectors. I'm connecting my VPD sensor to these terminals which is another little PCB I built that accommodates a couple BME 280 temperature and humidity sensors as well as an MLX90614 infrared thermometer. Three out of my four VPD sensors I use have no problem communicating over about 10 to 15 feet of CAT6 cable but the last one gives me some bizarre readings at times, so I'm probably going to be redesigning these VPD PCBs and I'll put a little microcontroller like a D1 Mini on each of these boards to eliminate the long I2C run and just have them connect wirelessly instead. I'll just have to run 5 volt power to them instead of data. So if you want to create a PCB that's based off of this one, you can modify it in any way you'd like using the free Easy EDA software that I built them with. If you don't need two dimming circuits for your lights, or you don't want to use the Dallas One Wire for your water temp, or you want to get rid of the flood detection inputs, that's totally fine. You can scrap the existing circuits and repurpose these pins for anything you want. Maybe you want an RGB LED for status, or physical buttons that you'll build into the lid, whatever. Like I mentioned earlier, this is literally the first PCB I've built, and putting these kinds of circuits together is something I'm just learning, so I'm in no position to give instructions on how to actually design your circuit in PCB, but I can show you what the software and the process looks like. There are some great tutorials on YouTube for how to use EasyEDA, so I encourage you to check those out if you want to give this a go. 
I think the best ones to start with are on the official Easy EDA YouTube channel. They have a tutorial playlist from 2020, and the two best videos to watch on that playlist, in my opinion, are number two, which is how to create a project, which also gives a very basic example of building a simple PCB, and number 12, PCB layout, which goes more in depth. So the workflow looks like this. You create a project and then start by drawing out your schematic. Then you convert the schematic to a PCB. Then you create a Gerber file and submit that to PCB manufacturers to order your boards. Let's start with the schematic. For the schematic, you can pick from common generic parts on the left, things like connectors, headers, or resistors, the basics of any PCB. Some of the parts will be surface mount and some will be through hole or axial, so keep that in mind. If you want to solder components on yourself, which I did, you'll probably want through hole stuff. If you want the PCB manufacturer to build the boards and put as many components on them for you as possible, you'll want to use surface mount stuff. There really isn't a whole lot going on with my PCB, so through hole wasn't much trouble. If you search the parts databases, you'll find thousands of parts that manufacturers or users have drawn up, so if you're planning to use a specific component, you can search for it and probably find it so you don't have to draw the symbol and footprint yourself. I'm just going to open up the schematic for my PCBs here. Here's the ESP32 dev board and all its connections. You can manually wire things together with lines, or you can make it neater by using these little blue things called net ports to connect stuff together. For example, my Flood 1 and Flood 2 net ports connect pins 5 and 6 of the ESP32 to these terminal blocks over here. A super quick summary of the layout here. In the top left is my PWM circuit for controlling my AC Infinity fans. I'm grabbing 10 volts and ground that's provided by the fan and using a MOSFET to take the PWM signal from the ESP32 and sort of boost the range from the standard 0 to 3.3 volts that the ESP32 typically does to 0 to 10 volts that the fan wants on the PWM wire. Below this is the voltage regulator that takes in 12 volts from the Meanwell power supply and knocks it down to 5 volts to feed the ESP32 board and the ultrasonic sensor. I've got a little LED here that lights up to show the board has power, which I found was not really necessary since there are other indicator lights like on the ESP board or the motor driver board, but you could instead solder wires to this connection and then put the LED on the outside of the box or something, that would make more sense. Here I've got my two grow light dimming circuits. These are just optocouplers that essentially open and close the grow light driver's dimming circuit very quickly to tell the driver how bright I want the lights. As I mentioned before, these only work on drivers that have a dedicated dimming circuit with two dimmer wires that support PWM dimming and source their own current. These are the ultrasonic connections and the waterproof thermometer connection. Then I have my flood detection inputs. And on header pins, I've got my motor driver pins and the ESO circuit headers, which are just I squared C. And last but not least, I have my I squared C, 3.3 volt and ground terminal blocks. Once you're done building your schematic, the next step is to convert the schematic to a PCB. If this is a new schematic and there's no PCB already generated, you're going to see a purple outline and all the parts from your schematic. The purple outline is the representation of the physical size of the PCB, and you can resize it however you like. All the components have these blue lines running between them called rat lines, and these are generated based on what you've connected together in the schematic with your lines or net ports. Your job now is to place all the components on the PCB in such a way that you're able to connect all these rat lines together with tracks or traces. The tricky part is you can't cross over any traces that are on the same layer. By default, this PCB is a two-layer PCB, meaning you can run traces on the top layer or the bottom layer. See what happens here if I try to run this trace across the existing one? So you have a few options. You can lay everything out in a way that you don't have to intersect any of these traces. Or you can run some on the top layer and some on the bottom layer. You can switch layers by clicking over here in the Layers and Objects toolbar to toggle between them. Or you can run stuff along the top layer and then duck into the bottom layer just to get past another trace and then come back up to the top layer. You do this with something called a via, which is like a little hole that lets you move to different layers of the PCB. See, I can go under this and then use another via to pop back up to the top here. 
Another option, if you have a lot of stuff that needs to get connected together, for example, if a bunch of things need ground, you can do something called a copper pour, and that can be used to tie all the pins together. Again, there are lots of great videos that go in depth on this stuff, so I'll link the ones that were most helpful to me in the description. We'll have a look at the PCB file for my board now. Here it is in all its glory. Some people with a little more experience out there are probably going, why in the f did he do it like that? But hey, it works, and when you solder up your own little creation and everything actually works, it is so satisfying. I ran most of my stuff on the top layer, as you can see, with the exception of a few traces on the bottom layer. I did a copper pour on the bottom layer to catch all the ground connections. You can tell things are connected to the pour because they get these little black ears on them. Something really neat you can do is preview the board in 3D to see what everything is going to look like. You just go to View, and then 3D View. I actually have a couple things that I want to change on my board. These ESO headers that tie the Atlas stamp to the I2C bus have the data pins in the wrong order. It should go 3.3 volt, ground, SDA, and then SCL, so I don't have to cross the jumper wires over like this. I'm also going to relabel the PCB to match the markings on the Atlas board, so they'll say TX and RX instead, and will be a little more intuitive. I'll go back to my schematic and find my ESO headers, and I'm going to swap pins 3 and 4 on each. Since I already have a PCB file that's associated with the schematic, I'll just save, and then rather than convert to PCB, I will update the PCB, and the changes will be applied. Now I've got to rewire these pins after I've moved them. So now that I'm done, if I want to get this printed, I need to generate the Gerber file. I'll go Fabrication, PCB Fabrication File, Gerber. I'll check the design rules, sure. And then from here, you can generate the Gerber file, which you can upload to any PCB manufacturer, or you can go right to JLPCB, which is where I got mine made. I used one ounce for the copper weight, and I went with the lead-free finish. I made the boards black and left everything else as is. That'll do it for this video. In the next one, I'm going to continue on and show you how I soldered all the parts onto these things and then installed them in my 3D printed boxes. If you're enjoying this content, it would be much appreciated if you would take a second to subscribe to the channel and like the video. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.